we will hopefully get a message about that. Um, just to let you know, we've muted you as you've all come in to the event. We will, when the discussion opens um, at the end of the event, we will let you speak if you would like, but you can always use the chat function throughout the event to communicate your thoughts or to ask questions or, or to say anything. Um, the event will run in three parts. The first part will be talking about chronic illness and photography. The second part will be a discussion of the exhibition itself. And the third part will, of course, be open to the audience or to participants so we can have a bit more of a discussion around, around what this means. I, we're, we're coming up to 43 participants at the moment, so it might be difficult for us all to say something. So I, I think kind of keep in mind that we have limited capacity to, to let everyone speak, even if we'd like to. So again, think about sharing your thoughts. if not just on Twitter, but on, um, uh, not in the chat, but just on um, Twitter, et cetera. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the panel, the fabulous panel that I've been tweeting about all week. Um, firstly, I, I'm not as fabulous, but I'm Ingrid Young. I'm based at the center, uh, which I've already introduced. I'm a medical sociologist and I work in HIV and sexual health. And I'm particularly interested in um, arts-based methods. Uh, around activism and thinking about how to do qualitative research. Donna McCormack, do you want to give us another wave for people who've just joined? Donna McCormack is a senior lecturer at the school in the School for Literature and Languages at the University of Surrey. And Donna runs a project called Transplant Imaginaries. She does a lot of work in the medical humanities um, and I'll let her introduce her interests in the, in the next part. Chisoma Kalangi, Kalanga, I've just, sorry, Chisoma made a hash of your name. Um, you want to give us a wave? Chisoma is a research fellow in the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. Sorry, I should say she's a welcome research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And her interests are around sexual health, HIV, and narrative, particularly in the Global South. Um, Mark Thompson, do you want to give us a wave? Mark? is not got Travis with him. We can't see him just yet. <laughs> um, Mark Thompson is founder and co-director of The Love Tank, Prepster and Blackout UK and is interested in and has worked on and around sexual health, HIV, social justice and queer communities for quite a long time. And I'm sure we'll have much more to say than that when he gets, when we let him speak. Um, I think What's brought us together, apart from an interest in, um, besides the fact that I know all of these people, is that we all have an interest in illness, in the arts, and in social justice. And I'm really just delighted that we can all be together virtually um, to discuss the exhibition. We would rather be in person so we could have um, carried on the conversation, but we will work with what we've got. Um, <laughs> As you may have already seen in our blogs, in our tweets, I just wanted to mention that the project is concerned, particularly concerned with queer lives and queer experiences. So we think it's important to note that today is Trans Day of Remembrance, where we remember the trans and non-binary lives lost to murder, abuse and oppression. So please consider learning about and looking at um, trans organizations and supporting trans communities where you can and if you're able to. So I'm going to start the first part of the panel, uh, which is really thinking about photography and chronic illness. And I've, I've said a little bit about my interests, and I'm not going to speak too much longer because I've already been speaking for about seven and a half minutes. So I'm going to pass on to Donna, who's going to be the first speaker, who's, who's going to share with us her, her thoughts about the project and about chronic illness and photography. So I'll let you go, Donna. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to see so many people here, so many new faces and some familiar faces as well. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about the Capture and Chronic Illness Project and why we wanted to do it and what it came out of and I think like most or many projects certainly kind of queer projects it more or less emerged out of a random conversation life events hanging out drinking tea and wondering what's happening in the world and yeah so 
it's come out of a project. So Ingrid and I worked on um, a project last year where we were looking at the links between HIV and organ transplants. So we were looking at the ways in which these have been connected, um, both in terms of kind of experiences and also in the fictional context. So as Ingrid said, I work on the fictional side of things. So I tend to be looking at novels and films. And so building on from that, we were trying to think of the ways in which HIV and transplantation are connected. And one of the ways in which we were thinking about that was in relation to chronic illness and what chronic illness is. And are HIV and organ transplants, are they chronic illnesses? Both at some points were seen as acute, but have they kind of shifted to a more chronic illness and what do we mean then if they're not acute and they are chronic so those were the kinds of questions that we were starting with and wondering what are the implications if you talk about organ transplantation which is supposed to be a life-saving intervention what happens when you think of that as a chronic illness or a chronic health concern how does it change how we think about it, how we live with it, and how we describe it or represent it. And, and similarly, Ingrid was asking questions, and these questions, I guess, have been ongoing in the context of HIV for much longer than in something like organ transplantation. And then the kind of visual side of it, I think is a twofold, um, it almost came out of two separate but related things. One was back in something like 2015, I started um, with a photographer friend of mine exploring film photography. And I was really interested in, so the kind of image that is behind me, this, I wanted to work out ways of engaging with transplantation where you have a memory of someone who died, but you never knew them. So in the context of organ transplantation, that comes in that if the donor is someone who has died and then has gone on to donate their organs. So we kind of spent time exploring how you might represent that. And I really wanted to work with this idea of haunting. So we took these pictures, um, over a series of years. Um, and this is actually in a children's playground, even though it possibly looks more profound than that, but it was a perfect place to be able to balance a camera on various playground type things. Um, so the idea was just, how do you represent what is actually quite a complicated idea? How do you deal with the fact that you've lost someone, but you never knew them? So that was kind of coming out of the project that Ingrid described that I have on transplant imaginaries. But the other side to it is the much more personal side. And 2015 coincided with my own experience of becoming more ill. So, I mean, it was kind of interesting and I don't want to jump in on Mark's, um, what he might talk about, which I don't know, but I saw that Mark in his photos talked about being diagnosed um, as HIV positive in 2007, um, at the age of 17, sorry. And that made me think that my first diagnosis was at the age of 17. And like he said, I also feel like I don't know whether I can imagine anything prior to that diagnosis. It's been so fundamental. But in a way, for me, the difference has been that anything to do with chronic illness changes and transforms over time. And so what then started happening in 2015 was so different, even though I'd lived with illness all my life from anything I'd experienced before. And so turning to photography in a way was to try and engage with how can you represent it or talk about it 
when actually it's quite difficult or you may not have the words or you might feel that people don't understand you so you don't want to put it into words and are there other media so with Ingrid we decided to try and explore this as a possibility and then what you have is we wanted to see how other people would represent these ideas we wanted to see if we could create a space where other people would talk and share their ideas through a medium that obviously often doesn't involve words or certainly not in the way that we are sharing today so yeah I think maybe I will stop there and yeah let Mark go on to say what he wants to say Thank you so much, Donna. Um, and thank you, Ingrid, for both of you for organising this event. I'm really glad to be here. Um, it's a, it, it, for me, it's always a real pleasure to be able to talk about art and photography in, in our work because it's, it's really important to me. It's a personal passion of mine. Um, and very often when we're talking about illness, we're talking about HIV, it can sometimes be quite dry. Um, and the visual representation that we've got is a completely different way to engage and to have that conversation. So um, Mark Thompson, um, as Ingrid said, I'm a kind of an all round kind of social justice activist. I work with the very lovely Will Nutland at the Love Tank and we do lots of good stuff in the community. Um, and we're here today to talk about the, my submission, which was the Through Positive Eyes program, which I participated in in 2015. Quick bit of background, uh, Through Positive Eyes is a global project. Um, it's about photo storytelling. It was organized by, I think it was University uh, UCLA and the Gear Foundation and a great photographer who's done a lot of work in the HIV community for a number of decades, Gideon Mendel. And the, um, the, the concept of the Through Positive Eyes was to bring together people live with HIV from across the globe giving them a camera and getting us to then go off and photograph our own lives and to give testimony to that. And when I was looking over my own selection of pictures today, which were taken five years ago, I reflected that it was just, as you said, Donna, it was a moment in time. This was one week in my life that I was able to capture. And reflecting on what you said again, things have changed significantly for me in the past 30 years since my diagnosis. But participating in the project was really important for a few reasons. And I've kind of just looked through some notes. And the first one was it enabled me to connect with community in a creative process. And very often for people with chronic conditions, when we are connecting this through peer support or how do I manage my meds or how do I reduce loneliness and isolation. And this gave an opportunity for us to come together as a community of practice to develop a new skill, to talk about art, to talk about creativity, and also to look at how we represented ourselves around our HIV. So that's why I took part in it. It was, it was really important. I think secondly, what was really important, I think what's come out in the photos that I shot was it was about, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, normalizing HIV. It wasn't about normalizing so we all become this heteronormative, we're all lovely, having these wonderful lives, etc. It was about showing the messiness, the joy, the celebration, the dark times, the loneliness that we globally as a community of people with HIV can experience. And then the third part for me was really, really important was about representation and representing the black gay male African black British experience, which is very unique to me. So in my photos, not only did I want to show the kind of standard stuff of kind of what lots of people do in these kind of things, of taking medication or getting your bloods done, um, but it was also really important to show my family, to show that black communities from the Caribbean can be supportive, can be loving. It was really important for me to demonstrate me engaging in my Jamaican barbers as well. So my sexuality and where that sat within my community was really important for me. Um, it was about challenging stigma, but not from the point of view of saying to people who are HIV negative, you should be nicer to us. It was more about saying, 
we are strong, we are empowered, we are important people. And that's why doing that work for me really made some sort of steps towards addressing stigma by empowering the individual to take forward the message. And I've certainly seen from the people that I engaged with over that program of work, it being really important. So that's the kind of project, for, but for me, in my work, using photography and using art is absolutely essential. Anybody that knows the work that we do at the Love Tank, we put great emphasis on ensuring that our work is beautiful to look at and it's engaging as well um, because it draws people in, but it also shows the quality of what you're doing and why that's important. So that's just some of my reflections on it. Um, yeah, and I'll take questions later. Thank you so much, Mark. That was great. Um, and thank you, Donna, for your your thoughts and reflections as well. I'm gonna um, pass over to Chisoma now, please. Thank you. Um, I also want to start by thanking Ingrid and Donna for putting together this wonderful event. And also, Mark, it's been a pleasure to meet you and learn so much about your work with the Love Tank. I'm going to fumble through. I mean, you've mentioned some of the stuff I mentioned, but much more eloquent than I could have done. So I'm going to just let you, <laughs> you know, I just want to back you up with what I'm going to say <laughs> rather than even try to <laughs> engage. But um, my, my interests have always you know, revolved around black studies and reversing some of the negative experiences of the way the black body has been represented. I mean, the first introduction of the camera, one of the first focal points was black people and how formative that gaze, the colonial gaze was in really, you know, bringing forward a climate of anti-blackness, savagery that we're still trying to dismantle today. And I think that photography was such a powerful medium. I mean, art, art, artistic expression has always been a key part of many communities and the African community and how the African communities represented their own bodies was so vastly different from the way that they've been portrayed in photography and we're still fighting against this every single day. Um, so that as a subject matter was something that was of importance to me of kind of, you know, tracing that trajectory from black people as subjects to actually empowering, empowering, you know, visual imagery um, of black people behind the camera and taking you know, full control over the images that are, you know, in front of the camera as well. So in that sense, I wanted to kind of deviate into two strands. Um, there's the artistic work that's coming from Africa, but I think I'll start actually by talking about my own personal experience with chronic illness. Um, looking at pictures of myself when I'm, you know, I, I have chronic hypothyroidism, uh, chronic disease, I suffer from lapses of uh, fatigue and you know, some of the times where I can know I was feeling in a bad state is simply by looking at a picture of myself and seeing changes in the droops in my eyes or the enlargement of my neck. And photography became very difficult for me to look out of my own body when I was diagnosed because I'd start examining how my body was changing. So, you know, I'm not vain, but yeah, sometimes I'd be like, oh, that's a good picture. I was, I was doing all right today, you know, um, to all of a sudden becoming chronically ill and actually now examining my illness through the lens. Um, that has been my shift in engagement with photographs of myself. And I thought it was, you know, that's when we get to some of the photographs, um, some of the ones that were the most, that I was drawn to were ones that were exploring the self um, and different variations of how the, the sick body reacts um, and, and is represented on film. <clears throat> but um, going back to some of the points that Mark had said, and he said them much better, but, you know, it's uh, taking control of the camera, the image is often, not always, but often is about empowerment based on the history of photography of um, the black bodies and especially sick, sickness and illness and representing. We talk a lot in an African context about poverty porn and how this whole industry has been made around looking at sick African bodies as a means of drawing empathy from white people about how to feel about black people in order to help them and to uplift them. And what a toxic and damaging relationship that has been as well. So for me, again, some of the photos that I was really drawn to in this exhibition were people, some of the black people taking photos of themselves. There was lots of smiles. Um, there was, you know, also, lethargy and the whole spectrum. And I thought that was very important to see how black people represented themselves in the photographs as well. 
Um, then the other issue I'd already mentioned was about how photography can help to redress the colonial gaze. And again, to really understand how damaging, you know, the images that have been shared about black people have been to understanding our humanity and why photography is a very powerful tool in reinstating that humanity that has been, you know, dispossessed and actually, you know, just destroyed from our communities in many ways. Um, so looking at some of the photography of, you know, for example, uh, Yagazi Emzi, Nigerian, um, then, oh my God, the so South African photographer, her name escapes me, um, Muhole, I think, uh, Muholi, yeah, I, for, I forget her first name, as Ilan Muholi, I think, um, you know, her fixation on her own body as a way to kind of redefine what blackness means to her. And in that sense, it brings me to the final point that representation is so important, so, so very important, um, but also in these new, nuanced discussions about how do we ethically represent sick bodies as well. And so I'm really excited to hear some of the thoughts of people about their submissions and, um, and also just to discuss why representation matters when you're talking about either your own sick body or collective sick bodies. Um, Mark had mentioned about some of the photography that came up with um, HIV and AIDS and how empowering that was as well um, and how important that was. But again, we always look back to the history of how those images of Africans in overcrowded hospitals in HIV and AIDS wards was also used to weaponize um, a sense of helplessness amongst Africans. So the work that he's doing is just so incredible in terms of, of redistributing that power back to HIV positive people or people living with AIDS um, as a sense of saying, I need to take ownership of how my body is represented or how my body is, or how the bodies of people in my community and my culture are also represented. So with that, I think I'll hand the floor back to Ingrid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chisoba. I think we probably could have had a four hour discussion on some of this stuff. I feel a little bad kind of limiting you to, to a few minutes, but thanks, some really powerful reflections. And I, and I think that, um, pleased I introduced, or I invited you both to the, to the, to the panel. Um, I think the, the, um, the points you raise about uh, the gaze, the colonial gaze, I think are something that we, we were definitely really quite interested in, in thinking about. And I, on the website, I linked to, um, we link to autograph the the gallery in london which is amazing actually I, I i think if you're in or around london you need to go there but they ran us um a two-part webinar series i think it was autograph i might be misattributing them but certainly the director was at it um a series called decolonizing the lens um and i think uh, maybe it was the director of autograph spoke and gary young spoke at it but talking about the role of um how the camera is a colonial um, mechanism or structure and, and what that means to look and how we can think to how do you decolonize the camera and I'm not saying decolonize because it seems to be a trendy word these days absent of any kind of meaning um, I, I think it's a very important um, concept for us to think about it both through the kind of art that we talk about that is empowering but thinking also about that history and I think the histories you brought up Chisoma are interesting. I studied history in a previous life on the camera and the photos of um, First Nations communities in Canada and, and thinking about who's included in the photos and who's excluded what is the makeup of the photos is also really, really significant. I'm not going to go on too much about this because this isn't a lecture. This is meant to be a discussion. So I think um, I want to move us on to the the next part of the of the discussion. And I'm going to attempt to try and share a screen. So um, what I should have said at the very beginning is thank you so much to everyone who submitted photos. These have been amazing. We have been blown away by the 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 beautiful, difficult, really powerful images, and actually such a range of ways of representing um, chronic illness. And I think one of the images that we used to start to circulate the, the call was uh, an image by Justin J. Wee called How I, the chronic back pain from his series, How I Hurt, and it's, 
it's kind of made Donna and I both think about how do you represent chronic illness without a person. So Justin's photos are a series of images that do not involve a person at all, but they they are things they are trying to represent different types of illness. So it kind of made us think about how do you do that? So thank you to everyone for, for all your amazing submissions. Um, we, as a group, tried to uh, reflect on, or we're, we're gonna attempt to reflect on the, the exhibition and talk about the exhibition. And we asked each of the panelists to choose a photo to talk about. Um, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen and hopefully share the right bit of my computer. <laughs> so, um, I'm always a bit dubious about, about this. Um, right. Just going to... If you bear with me two seconds, I will um, try and get it onto the right part of the computer. Sorry, talk amongst yourselves, please. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what you can see because I can't see it. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to make this large. So this was the Justin J. Wee image that we, um, we shared that we that spawned us on to thinking about kind of how to represent how to represent things. Um, can you see, I don't know what you can see, um, but hopefully you can see the first image. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Mark because Mark chose Aggie's images. So I've just put one up on the screen and we'll have this up for just a few minutes while Mark is talking, but we'll remove that so we can hear Mark. We can see Mark as well. So Mark, can I hand over to you to introduce the photo and tell us what you why you chose it? Okay. So um, the image is of a, uh, a white woman on a sofa with her hair hanging low. It's kind of black and white sepia toned. Um, and she's got a cushion underneath her and three cushions behind her. And she's got her legs crossed with one underneath. Um, when I looked at the submissions, my eyes were immediately drawn um, to all of the work by, by, by black uh, by, by black folk because that's what I was drawn to immediately and then I, I dug a little bit deeper and this really spoke and, and, and stood out to me because um, early in this summer it was quite personal early in this summer I was diagnosed with cluster headaches which is another chronic condition which is very often unseen and I saw these three pictures and I related to them because I, I've been in these positions physically i i've lied down in in absolute pain and i'm not sure if, if aggie is in pain here but these spoke to me because i could see myself in them so there was that thing immediately of here is a a white woman from a very different experience to mine but i'm immediately drawn to that and when i stepped back from it and i looked at looked at the pictures it just they did the, the, the loneliness the isolation of, of this struck me. And that is something that goes so strongly alongside chronic conditions. And also very often our pain is, is invisible, but how we express that pain can be incredibly visible um, in the way we may gesture, the way we may cry out, the way we may need holding. And there was, there was, there was some softness in there as well as this kind of pain, which, which I felt for, from these images there. And they just felt really beautifully shot. And I'm not sure if they are self portraits, but if they are to, to be able to do that when one's experiencing that. And whenever I've been in my episodes of, of clusters, I've wanted to capture that pain that I've gone through to demonstrate, to show to people what I'm going through. And I think this captured that for me. So there was an opportunity for me to relate to them, for me to see them. And, and that, that's why they struck out to me. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to stop sharing for now and hopefully I'll get us back to where we need to be. Um, can I invite Donna or Chisomo to respond to or add to what Mark said about that photo? Sorry, my screen has frozen. Oh, there we go. 
Oh. Yeah, while Chisomo unfreezes her screen, maybe I would just say, so um, I actually know, and this is where it becomes like knowing is one of those strange things. So I know Aggie from Twitter, um, although I've never met and I've never held a conversation with her. Um, I follow her on Twitter and she is a person living with ME. And I think this was an important context that we wanted to capture. So this kind of idea of um, you use something like um, invisible pain or invisible illnesses, but actually you then went on to say they're definitely not invisible to people who live with them or the people who live with the people who live with them but still how do you go about representing that and also illnesses that are often seen as not real or they're not recognized by that could be friends family or maybe ex-friends and um healthcare professionals so also that kind of um, denial of illness that can actually be a really big part of dealing with illness itself. So yeah, I thought what Mark said was brilliant. It's amazing. Sorry, I'm all stable now. Um, that Absolutely, that's just to follow on what Donna was saying that that's one of the things that I picked up on Mark's statement as well that um, there's a sense of denial. One of the things about chronic illness is you're constantly facing shame and abuse for not proving your symptoms, um, invisible illness especially. And one of the things that really struck me about the photo is that it appears that her head and her hair are in motion. At least, you know, that's what it looks to me. And so it begs a lot of questions about whether she's shaking or if it was just the moment of the camera, but that's a lot of the times of what happens when you're in solitude and living through these symptoms. And the camera has this amazing way of capturing that. You know, we would never know what that is, but why is her head more in motion in that sense? And um, speaks a lot to the condition about, and also the pose that she's in as if she's trying to get um, some sort of a control over, over her body. So I think it was a very powerful image as well. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was I was responding to someone in the chat. Thank you, Chisomo. I mean, I I do think that um, that the the person who submitted the the photo, Aggie, did talk about um, taking it in an ironic sort of way. So I think she was also responding to the the criticisms that it's not a real illness, and and actually let me let me show you. Let me let me be ironic. So I, I do think that there's some really interesting ways in which photography can be provocative. It's not just representing. I think it's provocative. It's taunting. It's going well. Let me let me depict to you what you think you know about me. And I, and I do think there's some interesting kind of can photography be in, be a part of a dialogue or be a conversation or or kind of a response to to, to wider concerns. Mark, did you want to say something? You, you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen again and move on to the next um, person. Okay. So hopefully, you can see that, and hopefully, I can move it on to Chisomo's choice. Chisomo, do you want to introduce us to this? Photo. I think John is definitely on the call, so in the meeting, so no pressure. But do you want to tell us about this? Image? Oh, no pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, no, actually, I don't have any, you know, there's nothing to be pressured. It was just an absolutely gorgeous shot. And um, I hadn't read, I, I tried to do this thing where I didn't want to read anything about the person or about the photograph until after I'd made a you know, decision about why I was so struck by it. But it really did strike to me about bringing forward one element of a symptom that I couldn't pinpoint. And I just saw myself in this photo. That's why I chose it the days that I am really struggling, I can feel something in my body that is so specific. The fatigue is so overpowering. And then when I actually looked at the write-up and it was talking about chronic pain, I said, okay, 
that's what I had felt, not, not necessarily pain, but identifying something in the body that was overpowering any sense of taste, any sense of color, any sense of expression, but was just trying to manifest in this expression of a symptom. That is what I saw. And, and you know, I loved the, the, the writing, my spine is a cloud, um, you know, in, in that sense of something that if you're flying through a cloud, for example, I mean, it's, it's this something that dissipates when you're going through it, but it's so thick um, and turbulence and you can fly through and it, it really rocks you. So I, I just thought it was absolutely brilliant to see how he had written about, you know, pain as a cloud and the process of going through it and the turbulence and shakiness and everything. I felt it. Thank you, Chisomo. I'm going to... Um... Again, open this up to the panel if Donna or Mark, you wanted to respond to what Chisomo said or had anything to offer yourself. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I mean, I really, I really liked the image and I reflect what Chisoma just said there as well about, you know, moving through pain and it can be this big, heavy thing that we carry. But as you said, it does dissipate like a cloud. I love the mystery of, of the photography as well, but I wasn't entirely clear what was being displayed there as well, which again kind of relates to how we might experience chronic illness. You know, that it is, it is a mystery. It's not easily defined and explained even when it is diagnosed. So relating back to the last image that we saw that these are things that we carry alone and our experiences of them, no matter how the symptoms or, or the diagnosis may be reflected in several people, are completely unique to the individual and our circumstances and the lives we leave and the people around us and the support we get informs how we experience and manage that. And I think that's kind of what came out of it for me. It's a beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with what Mark and Chisomo have said. I mean, it it's such a beautiful image I kind of want to know how he did it because <laughs> I mean it to me it almost looks like a negative which in and of itself is a fascinating way to represent illness and experiences of illness that you're you almost can only show the thing on which light reflects you can't show the outcome if there's always this like level of translation between them so that you're trying to show it, but it's almost never going to capture what it is that you want to convey. And also, I thought it looked quite apocalyptic, which kind of is what pain can feel like sometimes. Sometimes it does feel like everything's going to end when you're in pain or you want it all to end because you're in pain. And so I, I did feel that that kind of negative, as in, not the opposite of positive, but the negative of a photograph um, was quite powerful in conveying that idea of, you know, you're at the end of the world kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on, I think, to speak about, Donna's got a couple of photos she wanted to talk about, so I guess organizers prerogative, <laughs> she can choose to. <laughs> um, Okay. I, I have cheated, that is true, but I have cheated, I feel like for a valid reason. So in a way, I mean, this responds um, to what Mark and Chisomo were saying. And I thought it was interesting that Mark was saying, you know, initially you were drawn to images um, of black people and then you, you started looking at the other images and seeing what's there. But in a way, part of what we wanted to do was to think about ways in which um, people of colour or queer people um, or other maybe what we might call marginalised groups are not represented or underrepresented, especially in something like photography, for the reasons that Chisoma outlined um, at the start. And of course, I couldn't not talk about Belinda Otis's work because I do work on transplants. And I think this is such a powerful image. Um, so many things to say about it, but on the other hand, I feel like it speaks for itself. Um, the idea of dialysis as this kind of 
whole mass of things that you're dragging around with you all the time, you know, all these different kind of punctures or puncture sites on your body. So for me, it really does capture the idea that I was saying earlier that transplantation is not a, not just or not only an acute experience, but actually for a lot of people, it's a chronic condition that changes your body, changes how you are in the world. And I think one of the things that Belinda is engaging with is the fact that often in transplants, it's represented in a very white framework and you often have young children representing the sort of miracle of transplantation so yeah I thought this one was so powerful I don't know whether anyone wants to respond I'm so slow with the unmute mute thing, um, but it's safer to do it that way. But I absolutely loved this photo as well. And I think there are very, you know, strong, strong unsettling, you know, positions of captivity and bondage, you know, which have mm -hmm. other layers of discourses and African representation. Um, but then also some of the symbolisms that she would have of, you know, head wraps and everything of identity as well. Of, of just, you know, signposting to an African woman who's in this tube system. Um, and, and she writes, you know, like, again, one of the photos that I did not want to read before I, you know, formed an opinion um, that this is what dialysis is. It's a life saving and, you and it keeps her alive. And it's a, a thief of time and strength. Um, and I thought that was incredibly telling in that sense of this is something that it keeps her alive, but it robs her of life as well. And, you know, that, you know, being, you know, being asleep, surrounded by the cylinders, having the tubes, the tubes are always there. Sometimes they're connected to the cylinders, sometimes they're not. And, but something is always there. Um, so I, I, I also just would have loved to hear more about that sense of not feeling free. Um, mm -hmm and feeling captive to this life-saving intervention. I mean, I'll just jump in as well. I mean, I absolutely, <clears throat> this, this was one of my favorites and it absolutely jumped out at me because of the power of it and everything that you both have said already. I think in addition, for me, it was, it was about the representation, I mean, the representation of all of the things that we need to do to manage chronic conditions as well. We, you know, I think as, as somebody said on one of the write-ups, very often we're seen as being at home, putting our feet up, uh, you know, watching Netflix as we manage our conditions. But to see all of that stuff that one carries around. So if somebody was to do a, a, a photo of all of the medication they would take, this was the kind of representation that I saw there. My only slight, I'm not sure if it's a caveat or, or whatever, my only kind of like other side of the coin was the representation of the strong black woman. And I, I absolutely love that. But I also kind of couch that in the terms of black women being seen to be strong, therefore less receptive to pain, da, 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 all of those things. So I love the image of, of the strong, of, of strength and the head wrap, but I also kind of stuck, sit that aside where black women sit in healthcare and the sufferings that they've had as a result of that stereotype of having high pain thresholds. So I think that's a really interesting kind of question which sits alongside those images and also the other images of, of, of black folk which sit within the submissions. Thank you everyone for, for, I think again, we could we could talk about these for quite a long time. I, I, again, I thought they were, they were beautiful. I'm gonna move on to the um, next image that Donna has chosen. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, the, the reason I wanted to um, include this one is because actually, I think it's this goes back to what you were saying about the the image that we had for the whole exhibition or the whole kind of um, project, Justin J. Wee's photo. And this to me is one of those photos where it doesn't include people. And I think this is a really fascinating way to represent 
illness, health, living, surviving, getting through the tools we rely on, the technology we need, the medication and so on. And I think it's actually a beautiful photo, the sun shining in, it's almost like a rainbow. And at the same time, there's nothing really that beautiful about a commode when we think about it, maybe on a practical level, even though at the same time, a commode is extremely important um, and can be essential. Um, and again, I mean, I, I thought it captured, even without the description, you know, the this idea that, well, actually what Mark just said, oh, you must be sat at home. It's great that you get to sit at home all day and watch telly and enjoy Netflix and lie on your couch. But actually, no one's thinking about all those really tiny steps that it takes to do even just just small things that people don't even notice. And for me, it was like when I learned that actually I would no longer be able to have a shower every day. You know, it was like it, it seems so unimportant, but it was like my world fell apart. It was bigger than undergoing major surgery for me. It was just like, and I hadn't understood all the steps involved to taking a shower. And I think this is one of those things that you might find something like going to the toilet a really easy and obvious thing, but actually there are so many stages to it. So I really wanted to have something that didn't represent a person and really to try and, you know, capture that actually represent an illness. It, it is about people, but actually it's also about ideas and um the objects that we engage in so yeah that's why i wanted this in there thank you donna any responses from marco chisomo to this image yeah i mean it was just gorgeous this kind of ray of light that surrounds you know this this um you know contraption to help you use the commode but also the absence of people is also something I wasn't expected um you know and I, I think I actually had seen a comment in the comment box that I wanted to respond to that emerged as Donna was speaking about um from Jennifer about you know COVID you know helping having empathy with chronic illness and I think this is such an interesting concept because you know one of the things that I teach in you know narrative medicine is the idea that can empathy be taught? Um, are these images going to teach people about, you know, the, you know, all the process that Donna was talking about just now, um, that nobody knows except you when you have to go through it, um, and bringing everybody on board. Now, COVID definitely is bringing a sense of understanding that a lot of the stuff those of us with chronic illness were told that we couldn't do everybody now gets to have access like inequality, you know, like this. And I felt that this photo is like the symbol of, of these, this kind of like access and equality that now is open to everybody that people with chronic illness just haven't had ever. Um, is it going to stay? Is it going to last? I don't know. But I think that's really about the, I felt about the power of the image that this is, this is, this is an accessibility unit. This is something that if you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is. You don't know why the latrine is missing. Um, you, 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 it's there, there's a lot of learning that has to come with chronic illness diagnosis. There's a whole new world of things that you have to learn how to use. Um, and even the spacing, I mean, this, 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 you know, this machine is in a well-lit gorgeous room. You know, the, these, these are, these little things matter so much when you're dealing with chronic illness. So I thought there was a lot of symbolism and imagery that extends way beyond the photo. And for that reason, it was just absolutely wonderful. I think, I mean, I, the only thing I can add to that is I just thought it was beautifully shot. It was really nicely lit, the ray of, ring of light around it. It kind of, you know, almost gave it kind of a religious quality, you know, the, the beauty and the cleanness of it um, that, that just struck me. I, I particularly liked the title, a so-called silver lining. And I, uh, I think that uh, what Paula wrote about it was, is quite powerful that, you know, how 
you know, this for some people is seen, and actually I'm not sure if I'm reading into this or if it's a discussion I've had with Donna about it, but the assumption that this is a benefit, right? That this is this is often seen as um, the, the benefits you get from being diagnosed is you get all of these things, you get access to um, additional mobility aids or, or other sorts of aids and that sometimes they're talked about as well you you're you're benefiting from your diagnosis and 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 the 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 difficulty with conveying actually this is about these are your meeting your essential these are about meeting your basic needs to be a, an autonomous person I don't know if Donna you want yeah to I mean to I, I would just say that I mean Paula's image is definitely respondent to this idea that seems to dominate um, the medical arena of ME that in actual fact people do it not because they're unwell but because they gain secondary benefits so that's exactly what she's responded to so that's what she talks about the in actual fact you pretend you're ill because the benefits from it um outweigh being well so this kind of psychologizing of your physical symptoms which we know can happen quite a lot and so I guess showing um, the commode is a way of showing one of these benefits of living with ME. Yeah. I'm going to quickly move on to showing my image because I did have an image too. Um, and then we can, um, I, I'm conscious of time and, and how long we can keep going. So I think everyone can see that that's Donna's image. So I chose, um, I'm going to not say this correctly, Joyce de Amamendez de la Brena from Granada in Spain. So she submitted these photos and these are, there were a couple of submissions that were photos from photo voice projects or projects with other people. So actually this image and the images that she submitted are by women that she's worked with who experience, I think, um, uh, it's fibromyalgia and chronic pain. I, I, I'm a, I apologize if I've got it wrong. It's it's in the um, it's in the description. And I wanted to raise this not only because I think this is a beautiful image of someone smoking, and you so often don't see um, someone smoking represented in a way that's that's beautiful <laughs> in relation to chronic illness. You often see it as that's bad. You shouldn't do it. That you know all all of those kind of public health. Um, warnings um, and, and I think it's really beautiful and and this series of photos that she shared that her participants or that the women that she worked with took were were also about not not taking a picture of a person but about the things that surround us so that the series includes um, a cup of coffee or um, a bar of chocolate or th those sorts of things that, that support you, that, that help you get through that pain. And I thought that was really fascinating. And I, and I loved the kind of way that the images were, were varying kind of, you know, it wasn't pristine, it wasn't always clear, but actually it was, I, I quite liked that about it. But I, I also wanted to raise this because as a qualitative researcher who, generally tends to do interviews with people and people tell us their stories and tell us about their experiences. And then my role is to then translate that or write, write about that for the wider world. There's a, there's a real uh, burgeoning of projects where we are asking, as researchers, asking people to take photos of themselves. So like Mark's project with the Through Positive Eyes or, or there's, there's another one where um, Hani's, Hani Salim's photos uh, are from participants in her study of, of people living with a, asthma in Malaysia. And when you ask someone to take a photo for the purposes of research, I think it's really, really amazing and really powerful. So um, the work that you do when you're talking to someone for two hours, they tell really, really rich stories and experiences and you can learn so much about that when they share a photo you, you you gain such different insight into into their lives and certainly how powerful those photos can be in the context of of um 
medicine and health practitioners who don't experience that but have worked in the area for decades and then you show them photos that people have taken people who've been living with illness that people have taken um and it opens their eyes to things that they've never ever considered and so I, I wanted to and I think that can be really powerful and I think it also allows for different stories to be told so I, I chose this image and series of images really to think about um, how is that we communicate with each other and actually what is the role of research in here not to take away from um, live, lived experience but actually if you don't have lived experience of something how can one communicate that to others is it my role I mean there's all sorts of politics around appropriation of people's stories around people's voices do, do does the use of photography in research allow us to share or to to facilitate the telling of stories in different ways and and what does that mean so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing the image and I'm gonna invite the panel to respond to that or to, to reflect on that if you have anything to say around around that. Or I said it all. I think you said it all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really like, I, there's so much um, richness in that analysis. I genuinely don't have anything to add. In fact, <laughs> I'm hanging over things, to be honest. You know, it's like when you talk about I'm a qualitative research and I wrote it down because I just had, you know, whose, whose job is it to interpret um, and, and convey these stories to the wider world? I'm like, that is a huge responsibility. Um, and, I, and, I th and I think that's some of the trickiness of I don't think that interpretation is for everybody. I think you have to be of a certain character to be able to do that so that you can convey someone else's story to them. And I think a lot of the reason a lot of take pictures, so there's some people who do take pictures because it's how they can convey it. Um, it's without, without having to speak about it and, and allow for that interpretation. So I just, I there's a lot I'm hanging on to and I don't have anything better to add. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say, I love that someone submitted and you chose a picture of someone smoking because I think so often illness and especially certain chronic illnesses can be seen as things that you bring on yourself and that it's kind of your own fault or you could have avoided it you know and that that can be all sorts of kind of um even acute illnesses, but especially with chronic illnesses. And I really liked um, that actually we have an image where someone, you know, is showing the beauty or the need for these things that might be seen as harmful and that public health messages, while undoubtedly helpful, are not always the best way to deal with bodies, health, how we engage with each other in society. So yeah, that part I thought was really powerful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think that we could probably keep talking about a lot of the photos. We didn't have time to go through each of the submissions. I think if we you know, can imagine we were in a gallery and we walk through, we would still have to choose, choose submissions. But I think, um, there were so many other photos we could have chosen. And I want to reiterate that choosing these photos wasn't because they were the best or they're our favorites, uh, or I think we were, it was a struggle to choose to choose which photos to talk about. Um, I'm conscious of time and I know we, we said we would open it up and there are still quite a lot of people here, which is, which is fantastic, um, including some of the people whose photos we've talked about, um, but, Donna, you, before we move on to the discussion, um, you had said you would talk a little bit about something. Um, do you want to share that? Um, yeah, um, I mean, I'm happy for us to also just move on to um, questions. I think one of the things that Ingrid and I have talked about in relation to this project, and maybe I can invite Chisomo and Mark um, 
to comment on it is the idea of coming out and what does it mean to come out and you know often that language is used in relation to sexuality or gender um, but of course in the case of illness you often come out over and over and over again or in some cases you come out in contexts but not others so you might not come out at work it might be too risky or you know there might not be a supportive environment but you might come out to or you might come out to your mum but not to your dad or you might come out to your sister but not to or oh, what one group of friends but not another group of friends and and also within that is and something I'm definitely fascinated by is um do you have to come out you know what in a way is there a need to validate when we talk about health by coming out or can we talk about it without coming out? It looks like Mark's going to say something. So go ahead. <laughs> you need to put your mic on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just looking at the, the, the comment. I, I uh, was listening to you as well. Um, yes. I, 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 for me, I guess I, I think it's in, important to come out, but only if it's safe for us to do so. And that applies to our conditions as well. It's important because it gives face um, and it enables us to get the support that we want. From my own experience, and I felt like you lived in my life just there, Donna, when you described all of those different intersections of, of coming out because I've experienced all of those. But I think that what I just really want to just pull out really quickly was that I have always been semi out about my HIV to friends and family and certainly in the work that I did. When I did the Through Positive Eyes project, um, it was not my intention to go public about my HIV, but as soon as I did it and I went through the week long experience and saw the work that we created, that pushed me. And that's when I publicly, publicly came out about my HIV. And it was again, the best thing that I did, but I was able to do that through this medium and the photography made the blow made, made the landing softer you know because I could wrap it up in this lovely project and this lovely piece of work and that was my look what I did by the way I'm HIV positive I don't know do you want to say something to say about this Uh, no, honestly, I think sometimes you have to respect when someone has said something so powerful that the best thing to do is to leave Mark's statements yeah. just yeah, to absorb that. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mark. I think, yeah, it it's a really powerful idea about how does it help validate and at the same time, is it safe to do that and in what situations are you safe? So yeah, maybe now we can um, head over to questions or any comments. Or... Yeah, I think we can open it up to comments. I'm going to try. I don't think we have the, I think, I, th I see Jennifer, you waving your hand. Did you want to say something? Okay. Well, let me see if I can unmute you because we've, okay, there you go. Go ahead. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm Jennifer and I'm just talking about the thing about outing yourself with illness, having somebody who's done that and been heavily trolled for it and heavily sanctioned for it, as well as uh, displaying something that's disgusting, unfit, disturbing, exploitational, you know, um, and that having to be managed by a gallery. As I put images up, um, um, I had cancer of the womb, cervix and ovaries, and then developed a non-Hodgkinson's lymphoma and all the side effects from having post-treatment from cancer, because everyone assumes when you have cancer that you've had treatment, they've cured or cut or removed the cancer away, but what they don't realise is actually what's left behind with the medication that you're on afterwards, post-menopause, all at 30, and you know all those kind of elements there, fatigue and everything. And I was heavily trolled, heavily uh, attacked online and actually uh, and verbally attacked in my own exhibition um, from saying I was exploiting the illness. This is not the kind of imagery people wanted to see. 
um, and they were, I, I did expose myself quite um, aggressively in terms of my actual, how my body was hidden underneath clothes and how that had been sliced up and moved, but also people just saying, we don't want to see a disgusting body. So I'm just in terms of that, in terms of positivity and terms of outing and I've continued to still do that work and address that but also letting people know it's 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 my haunting not theirs um, and I think that's always quite um, interesting that and in terms of also work I, I don't normally tell people about my illness until I've actually got the job or the contract to someone who's self-employed as weird rituals like have to have an hour to eat or else I vomit because of digestion issues due to cancer and stuff but yeah, that thing about um, it being a positive thing, um, I'm intrigued by that because that had not been my experience at all. Um, it's always been quiet, told to be quiet, shut up. It's disgusting. Um, I don't want to hear about it. It's too upsetting. Um, and try to express that in different ways. But also, like you say, in the boredom of also retelling your story all the time of having to out yourself with a disease. It's a boring tale that I think you get quite used to as well. Um, and not wanting the illness to own you still, but you having to take ownership of it. So that was sort of my comment really, that I just wanted to express in terms of that outing yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I mean, I think, I think there's some really interesting, interesting, I don't want to sound facetious. I think there's some really important issues here around the work that is done to represent or share and then you can be faced with quite a lot of negative horrible responses I mean Mark talked about coming out if it's safe and actually what are the what is what are the conditions in which it is safe to talk about your illness and and often how people respond to um illness is often more about them than you know like if about them than, than actually the person who's talking about their, their illness or, or sharing their experience. So I think these are really tricky uh, and difficult and emotional um, issues to, to, to manage. Um, I'm not very good at managing this. So if you kind of, I think I've seen, I, I don't see everybody, but M, Emma, is that? Okay, well, let me see if we can give you the possibility of, yeah, okay. Hi, um, I'm, I submitted the photo with the funny faces and my reason behind, I wanted to talk about that because out of all the other ones, mine was just, mine was just like a silly, that's because my story is I'm, I'm not coping well with all my illnesses. Um, I am kind of at a point in my life I mean, I've been, I've been, I've had so many different illnesses um, and I'm at a point where I'm just sick of everybody. <laughs> um, I'm sick of being judged. I'm sick of, I'm sick of pretending. Yeah, I'm sick of people asking me if I'm okay or is it someone new? And not the fact that it's an illness and it's not going to go away. It's still the same thing. It's still, you know, I have um, endometriosis and fibromyalgia and painful bladder syndrome and chronic sinusitis and asthma. All these things, my body's just fall into pieces. But my picture was mainly to show, like, on days that I can, I, 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 I try my best. On days I can't, I just want to hide away. It wasn't really about Netflix, even though that's what I do. I just want to hide away. Um, as I can't pronounce your name, sorry, kiss some, some, yeah. <laughs> um, I realised that I don't like seeing myself ill. I can't stand it. I look awful. Um, you know, I put weight on. I've got baggy eyes. I've, uh, I look terrible. And I only have photos of me with my family when I'm being silly or would, or in a good, when it's a good moment. I only want trying to remember the good moments. And as, sorry, Jennifer, you've been through so much love. It's awful. Um, that you do get kind of trolled, like, 
oh, you're sick again, or, or, you know, all these negativity comments, or when you go to the doctors or the hospital, it's like, they'll blame one illness on another illness, and you never get back, like, for example, like, I have fibromyalgia, so they'll be like, oh, whatever you've got going on, you know, because so many um, symptoms relate to other conditions, so they'll be like, oh, it's, you know, totally push you aside, and be like, um, no, it's, sorry, my brain, <laughs> um, um, yeah, they'll be like, it isn't, it isn't um, anything else, it's your fibromyalgia, and it's like, that can be dangerous, that can be very dangerous, then pushing aside, things like that, and also, um, this constant having to explain yourself over and over again to doctors, you kind of develop not a not exactly a PTSD, like, you know, war veterans and everything, but you develop a kind of PTSD about even going to doctors and getting help. So you just, you just sat there. I know I am. I'm sat there some days. I feel terrible. Do I go to the doctors? No, which just going to, you know, put me through the ringer again. Anyway, thank you for everybody who submitted and everyone's thoughts and all this. Thank you. Thank sorry, you, for, sorry for babbling. <laughs> no, that was so powerful. Do you mind if I respond to Ingrid? Please go ahead, yeah. Um, both to Jennifer and Emma, I mean, thank you for your contributions and solidarity and support to all of the pain and abuse that you felt, not just through reactions to your art, but actually just reactions to your life. Um, there's a lot of ugliness that comes with, um, you know, we, we talk a lot, most of us who have chronic illness have an element of chronic fatigue that comes with our conditions. Um, and it's very, I, I heard you, Emma, you know, when you said that you people will let go or drop or even the brain fog, you know, all these terms that make sense to us as we're speaking. Um, I think, and also that idea that for me, the representation that matters the most is how I feel about myself. And I'm allowed not to feel good about myself because I know what I feel like when I'm things are good. But probably the biggest thing, which I'd said once, and I've never let it go, I just said it by accident, that the most empowering thing for me is developing the power of terminology. I didn't have the terminology to explain how I felt about both my fatigue physically, but socially, you know? Um, and when I developed that strength, it was the most empowering thing. And I think, you know, a lot of what's in this discussion about the photography is the strength that it's bringing to all of us. We have a lot more solidarity in this space. Then what's going to happen is we press leave room and we have to go back into the shitty world um, where we, we deal with the stigma, where we deal with the lack of understanding. We deal with the stupid doctors who are literally focused on clinical symptoms only and not necessarily the broadest spectrum of what makes someone not feel well. That all, you know, depending on what disease you have with my disease, I can have perfectly level thyroid hormones and have all of the symptoms. And I will not be able to even use the power of terminology I've developed because I can't function to express myself. And we need something like chronic health doulas or somebody to show up with us to bring that power to us when we can't speak for ourselves. And how do we create a more compassionate understanding world? I don't have an answer. I have developed it by being more combative and to being more, you know, like they talk about, you know, I'll cancel you, you know, like to cancel culture. But for my own health and well being, it's a fight that I can no longer take on. You will learn about empathy through my exclusion from your life. That's not easy for everybody. And I can't do that with everybody. You know, for example, the family members who I love and who take care of me when I'm down, probably the one thing that pisses me off the most is when they say, you've been sleeping for 16 hours, haven't you rested enough? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, do you think this is about rest? You know, um, and the people who love and who are literally feeding me still don't get that I don't have control. Or of course, all the other things like when books like The Secret come out and it's so shame ridden about you don't have power over your body because you are weak in the mind. And things like that are things that I no longer tolerate and I will walk away from my own health. And I think that developing spaces where you can and can't do that has been life-saving for me. And I fully recognize that not everybody has the strength or power to do it, but for me, it has been life-saving. And to find these spaces, I mean, I've had the most hellish week and this has been 
this is a space that I knew that I was, despite all the work I had to do, I'm like, I'm coming in, Greg. Like, this is, like, you can recognize spaces where you need to hear other people. And these are moments where I will walk away and I've learned so much about the body. I've learned so much about other people's experiences. And I've learned so much about your story that it's not in my head, despite what my doctors told me for five years before diagnosis, that I needed to suck it up and do yoga, you know? Um, so it's, and I think that's, I'm just so glad that you were able to, you know, be so free because these spaces, they do, even if this helps you go on an hour before someone opens that door behind you and pisses you off, at least you've had that hour of solidarity and strength. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Chisama. Mark, you looked like you were leaning forward to say something. Are you just... No, just... Um in solidarity with Emma and Jennifer and, you know, just sending you hugs from Brixton, yeah. you know, <laughs> we, we got this. Yeah. It's tough, but we got this. I, sorry, go ahead, Donna. No, I was just gonna say, actually, um, Emma, your face, it was one of the ones that I really liked that people chose to represent themselves with other people. So the illness wasn't just about this individual as if we are isolated beings. And I liked that quite a few of the submissions chose to show that they live illness with other people. And that's regardless of whether people are supportive or not, or as Chisomo described so powerfully, that actually they may be the most important person. They may be what, you know, allow you to eat and drink and what have you, but they can still really be harmful in so many ways. And I really like that you chose to represent yourself with other people. So yeah, I found it really moving. You're on mute, Sorry. Go ahead, Will. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, the panelists. Um, thank you, Em and Jennifer, that really resonated. Um, I'm fairly lucky. I am Mark's work husband. And around the time that Mark found out that he was getting um, his, um, his, his headaches, I was diagnosed with COVID. Um, I'm now living with long COVID. I've been having long-term COVID symptoms for seven to eight months. I'm one of those people who proves that it's not just like mild flu. Um, thousands of us, tens of thousands of us in the UK, millions of us around the world were never hospitalized, but are now living with um, long-term um, chronic illness as a result of being infected with the virus. Um, and uh, for me, there's something that really resonates with some of the stories I've heard about about not being believed, about going to your family doctor, Chizoma, you just use the thing of, you know, I'll go and do some yoga and you'll be all right. Um, my GP after about telephone call number 10 suggested that what I really needed was a short course of counseling when I was telling her that I was awake for five or six hours every night with chronic limb pain um, and my, my limbs completely numb. Um, so um, people don't believe that there is such a thing as coronavirus. People don't believe that um, wearing masks have any impact. Um, so on top of all of the conspiracies that we're dealing with um, globally, those of us who are living with long COVID um, are, are disbelieved. Um, for me, my, my image also resonated um, around something that Mark and I talk about a lot, around an added addition of aging, and a, an added addition of aging as a queer man in a culture that um, focuses on being beautiful, on having a particular body image. Um, and so for me, as someone who can um, no longer um, exercise in the way I want to, um, even, even basic exercise means that my body is starting to change in addition to aging within a culture that um, uh, doesn't like to see people starting to get droopy man boobs and beer bellies, um, unless you go to very particular venues. Um, but my positive take, um, Chizoma, you just reminded me of, of, um, of, of being asset focused here. Um, my positive take on this is that um, many of the many of the demographic groups of people who are living with con of long COVID uh, tend to be white, um, 
middle-aged women um, because lots of black folks are getting COVID and are, and are dying. So those of those people who are surviving, they tend to be of a, of a different demographic group. And my experience of being involved in some of those long COVID support um, fora is that those people are suddenly realizing what it's like to have to navigate a health and social care system that is completely broken. And I have sat in meetings with um, white middle-class um, middle-aged women who are now trying to navigate um, the benefit system and are weeping because of how tough it is um, and people who are coming away from saying hang on I used to be first in line at my GPs because I'm articulate enough to do that and now I can't get an appointment I demand to see my practitioner and are realizing they can't do it like millions of other people haven't been able to access a good functional health and care system. So my, my kind of, um, my Pollyanna take home from living with long COVID and being involved in this is there are a whole set of people who've suddenly had rockets put up their asses who realize what it's really like in the real world. And if we're gonna, you know, if anything comes out of um, this whole um, world crisis we've been living in, this pandemic we've been living in, as a whole load of people are suddenly gonna to have to wake the fuck up about how millions of other people in the world live and maybe they'll get off their asses and do something about it. Thank you very much, Will. I um, wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I think that's brilliant. Um, I've got Dresda asked to speak, so I've unmuted you, Dresda. Did you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments about the photos and thank you all the panelists. You are making such a good contributions and all the people that send uh, photos. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here with Connie. Connie is oh, my great. Partner. Yeah, Connie is my partner and she's, <laughs> and she's uh, well, the person of the photo. Um, basically, my intervention is about queer intimacies and queer relationalities because uh, I, I myself as dwelling in the other people's experience of chronic illness, it's different that of obviously my partner. And the photo basically, it's basically for what Donna says, like when people have this kind of illness and they smoke or they have another kind of like harmful habits, Adelaide's comments is why do you do this to your body if you are already sick, right? And Connie, I mean, I live with Connie and cannot remove myself from the fact that I sometimes I make such, such tough comments, right? Uh, and I think it has to do with queer temporalities, in my opinion, because uh, we were discussing yesterday this one. Like for me, the fact that she smokes is because she's interrupting, she's like breaking the future that I have envision with her, while she's smoking in order to be with me in the present, because smoking is what keep her be present with me. So uh, yeah, and th that's basically the love and hate relationship that happens within queer intimacies, but also queer intimacies with, with materiality and other kinds of animacies. And that's a little bit why Connie took the photo. And I don't know, Connie, if you want to say something real quick? Um, yeah, I, one, one thing um, um, I, what, I, what I like about um, the fact that, that it's a photo and, and, and the, the viewer and, um, and not only reader about the text, uh, has has a time to to look at the photo and i think the the reflection of of um of the person who is who is actually looking at a photo um is 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 a different one is it is it is not following a words in a text and and trying trying um to understand what is going to say but makes his or her own um um, words, sentence in the head, and and I think I appreciate exactly this very, very, very much because I can say so much, but on the end of the day, um, about my condition, I know that that nobody can really, really like put himself in my in my life. For me, the most important thing is that 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 somebody see that I have a, speci a specific condition and makes her or his own way how to deal with it. And, and this takes time and, and the photography gives you the time. It's captured one single moment and it at zip you time individually. It, every viewer has individual thoughts and individual text in the head. And this is, I think this is the powerful, or this is a plus 
for a, for a text or this that actually yeah opens a little bit more horizon i think and i i really really appreciate this because for me the most struggling thing is 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 the interaction with with uh, social um surrounding so there i love it when when somebody think about it have a reason yeah and just to say that she's uh she she has narcolepsy uh, and also like the narcolepsy is a really not well known condition so this is basically as well just to, to, to just to name her disease yeah thank you thank you very much i think that was that was great i'm i'm very conscious of time and and i said that we would end at 6 30 and i think we've we've been going for a while and i i'm conscious that we could probably keep going um i i, I think though that's quite a nice place to end in a way i i I'm struck by the discussions of time. Certainly it's something that Don and I have spoken about. And I think the difference between thinking about being with someone in the present and being with someone in the future and the disjunction between the person who is living with illness and the person who they are living with and, and what they experience. And I think, I think there's a lot to be said. I'd like to see if the panel, if Mark, Chisomo or Donna have anything they would like to add or, or end on. And apologies to those of you who didn't get a chance to speak. Um, I would just respond to say thank you to Dresda and Connie. Um, yeah, great to have you both um, here and I'm so glad that you brought up queer time and that we haven't really had time to <laughs> talk about um, you know the pleasures that I, I know that's not to take away from the difficulties but the pleasure that comes with and how we have to live with um, what we enjoy such as smoking that might go against how we're supposed to practice health or illness but in actual fact are the really important pleasures that we have to keep doing or that we want to keep doing and they may even be acts of resistance and yeah as Ingrid said I'm totally fascinated by um, queer time and I think you said this idea that you live with multiple cells so a bit like what Will said that you you have a, a self who's maybe changed over time that you're familiar with, but then you start aging on top of that. You kind of think, well, hang on, <laughs> how many incarnations am I going to go through? And, you know, could some of it, I don't know, slow down or something? So, yeah, I just um, wish we'd had more time also to talk about the kind of queer temporality pleasure side of it all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Donna. I just wanted to say thank you to the organizers, Donna and Ingrid, for putting this together, to Mark for sharing the space, um, and everybody, you know, Will and Emma and De Desda, who spoke, you know, so beautifully. Um, it's been such an important space for me, and it made oh, just so much sense in my life to make time for it. And I'm so grateful and hope I have a chance that we can do a part two, three, four, five, seven, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mark, any final words? I mean, I just echo what my fellow, fellow panelists have said already, and I'm really grateful for the space and also for the opportunity to share work that I haven't really kind of dug down into for a good four or five years. And so just to remember that has been amazing, but also just to reflect that these kind of storytelling, the use of art and photography are incredibly important collectively but also individually as well. So I would encourage people who may have chronic conditions or know people that do to, to engage in, in the arts, engage in photography, pick up and reflect what you're experiencing and, and put that out into the world. Because as we've seen today from this conversation, sometimes it's the only way that we can, to get people to hear us, sometimes they need to see us. And so I would encourage individuals to do that. But once again, grateful for the space. It's always amazing to do these things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was that was a, a lovely way to end um, to, to end the discussion. I I just like to thank again the panel, Mark Thompson, Jasoma Kalinga, and Donna McCormack, um, for your beautiful words and your thoughtful uh, reflections. I'd really like to thank 
everyone who submitted a photo. I think we were really overwhelmed by what was what was shared with us um, and to, to people who participated in this in, in this discussion. And also I should say thank you very much to Stephanie Sinclair, who I didn't introduce or thank, but who has been responding to everyone. There you go, Stephanie. Stephanie's been phenomenal in helping, uh, in, in running, in, in putting this together um, and putting the bigger Visualizing Bodies program together. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for all of your work on this. Um, I'm going to end it now. We will make the, the recording available on the website um, with a transcript uh, for those people who didn't manage it or should you like to listen to us all again. Um, and we will let you know uh, what happens in future. We don't have any concrete plans with this project, but it seems like there's a lot of interest so we can, we can see how we, how we move forward with this. Right, thank you very much everyone. And I will see you at some time in the future. Thank you.